I think the honorable thing for our species to do is deny our programming. Stop reproducing. Walk hand in hand into extinction. One last midnight, brothers and sisters opting out of a raw deal. We do not trust any friends or family members. I repeat, do not trust friends. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it kind of is. Hey, James, I went uh, to a uh, the theater and I watched Seven Samurai. It's in theaters at the present moment because they got a uh, 4K uh, re-release through the Criterion. Um, so it's been it's been in the circuits. It didn't feel like like it, as always. It didn't feel like a three and a half hour movie. It just went down. It just went down like so smooth and like just like a snap. Um, but it was really cool to watch with an audience because uh, everybody found um, there's that uh, the young samurai whose name is escaping me, who's coded as super gay. Um, and the audience like cause he's, he's prancing around all the time, you know, and he doesn't want to have sex with that girl who truly want who really wants him. Um and uh, yeah, it was just it was kind of the the comedy of it. Uh, you know, obviously it's at the expense of the gay coded character, but it's it's still there and it still kind of makes you laugh. And um, and Mifune, like the the you know like the farmer guy who's who wants to be a samurai, like that's fucking crazy, man. He that that performance is so much fun and so energetic, and and yeah, it was just really cool to hear everybody. Having a good time watching the Seven Samurai. Yeah, crazy. that's that's weird because I I wouldn't I wouldn't I don't think I could imagine it even put together with people like with an audience like what the reactions yeah. would be. That's that's it interesting. F- it was a full house, sold out, packed. That's that's uh, crazy. I'd like to do that with like yeah. I, there's a lot like Jaws probably be good for that. Incidentally, while well, they're going to be playing Jaws uh, in the month of October, but yeah, yeah, I mean, it is, yeah, it's cool to see these old movies in um, with audiences, whatnot. I love it. Yeah, there's an energy to it. Se- Seven Samurai too is that? Yeah, that's such a funny one, like you say, because I, I always, I haven't watched it in a long time. I should go back, but hmm. um, the, like you say, I always remember it just being like just going down so smooth because it feels like if you want to do Lord of the Rings, it's a slog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, something about the way it's paced. And it's so Star Wars. Like I was with my buddy and like we obviously Kurosawa was very influential to um, Star Wars uh, and George Lucas and stuff. But you you just, you know, the older you get, the more you catch. You're like, wow, OK, well, that's just there's the Ewoks. There's the thing. There's the stuff. Um, yeah. You once upon a time went to go see Ghostbusters, right, Chris? Yeah, I saw Ghostbusters in theaters. I've seen uh many as total recall i think it was my favorite to watch oh. like in a crowd yeah yeah it was uh it was cool because everyone there like absolutely loves the movie and like knows all the all the lines and all the shit you know they're like they're waiting for those parts and it's just a uh, it's neat to be in an audience with a bunch of fucking perverts like you yeah oh i like that right. just like our our audience and audience <laughs> perverts <laughs> like us <laughs> here at the extinction agenda with uh james nice james Chris and uh, today um, we're going to be talking. Um, I was trying to <laughs> trying to make it perverted, but it's not working out. Uh, Grant Morrison's new X Men. We're it's, we're getting back to our commentary, our elaborate commentary. Today we're doing uh, new X Men issue one twenty two to one twenty six, which was released between February and May of two thousand and two. Uh, but cover dated March uh, to July of 2002. So we got like five issues here and uh, we're going back to the house of fun. Uh, Anyone who's read the invisibles might get the reference and maybe understand what I mean, but I'll I'll elaborate on that later. Um, These are some of my favorite. I know I said this with the first three issues, um, but these are my other fi- some of my favorite comics like this. This is the high watermark for Grant Morrison's X-Men run, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the next issue with Zorn is one that I, I really admire. But um, I reread the entire series. Um, I don't know, the other night. Um, and yeah, this, this for me was like oh, peak. And then after that, it gets a little meandering and weird. And we'll get into it. There's there's good reasons for it. But how did you guys feel rereading this? I um I did not feel the same way as you. Right. <laughs> That's cool. How do you feel? Um I uh I don't know. I 
it's okay i mean it, the the i had a real bad time with the with the art at the end right. yes yeah um, and and it was it was but it was like not it was beyond bad it was it was not acceptable to be published it was, Sometimes that's true. It was the action was like completely nonsensical to the point where I had to try to imagine what what was was he having a seizure while he was drawing <laughs> was what, what the fuck yeah and, yeah and I got mad I got mad I got mad okay and so, I was like and the script was good I'm yeah. I'm rolling back my initial take on remember at one point I said that I felt like morrison softened script for mm-hmm. for you know corday or whatever the fuck the advanced skeever and corday yeah. um yeah i don't i don't think that's the case i didn't feel that here i felt like he continued on with his full story and that these guys had to sub in and shit the bed yeah well i will say like corday drew some of these issues in two weeks like that's that's a true a true story like um because Vance Giever couldn't do it and quietly couldn't do it. And they needed someone who could do it. And he Cordy's sh- a competent. Yeah. He, he didn't weeks to do, do it, it. And he did it. No, he didn't. Yeah, but he did it, man. Like, like, I don't know. It's a, it's I a guess. House, right? Did you see the Wolverine? Oh yeah. I'm not saying it's good. Like it's very bad, but like, honestly, you in in two weeks, draw this, you can't do it. And I know like he's a professional and, you, he, he gets held to a professional standard, which I feel that he failed. What makes it even worse is because um, I've got the original issues and um, they changed the paper stock when at the moment that Corday came in. And so the coloring is much more like sort of computerized and what and the inking doesn't cover up the mistakes as much. It's a perfect storm of bullshit. I fucking this is the comic like issue. 125 with Lilandra doing that crook thing. That's the one I got Cordy to sign. Um, well, Chris, you and I had the same thought. <laughs> yeah, just to send horrible images in chat. Yeah, yeah, we're just sending you bad thumbs <laughs> back over <laughs> in the middle of this conversation. Right in the middle right. of the conversation. <laughs> anyway, keep an eye out for that thumbnail, friends. <laughs> uh, but, so, yes. so, yeah, okay, the art's really bad. You're, you're not wrong. But, no, but Quietly's art's great. And Smasher's really cool, and the design for Xavier is fucking really disturbing. Anyway, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I and I like the I like the Shi'ar in this one. I like the idea of manipulating them to 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 kill the mutants. Um, that's very cool. Um, I don't know. I liked a lot of this, um, and then some of it was. Also, there's like a lot of little funny things too, like um, <laughs> you know, if you don't complain, if you're wishing to complain to Mr. Logan about injuries sustained in yesterday's field expedition, you're wasting his or her time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of comedy, yeah. little, little Logan quips and and funny stuff. Smasher was really cool. He really locked it down in that first issue um, with the cow. Yeah, I was thinking of that moment. So yeah, he, well, he broke through atmosphere. Give him a yeah. break. She's come. Protect the earth. I don't know. The the, the Shea are, are treated like fucking idiots. Like there's that one later later on. They're they're coming down and like you know, they don't give show me enough respect. Blah blah blah. I'm fucking just freezing out here. His brain through his head. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're they are disrespected. They're disrespected by Morrison in the same way that I don't know, like a bad Justice League member would be disrespected by a writer that hated him. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I think that's well, what I really gravitate to in this, too, because I, I typically don't like the Shi'ar episode. I don't like when the X-Men go to space. But this one kind of does it for me, for maybe picking up on some of that, just like the and the turn towards um, genocide, uh, how easily Empire slides into that with the... With, uh, mm-hmm. Cassandra Nova's prompting like that's is it's disturbing to think of the power they have like um quote unquote sterilization squads like they do this often it's yeah. like clearly mm-hmm. yeah and and it's yeah and it's normalized it's like it's yeah it's just part of the so you brought it up early but I really want to emphasize that um and and we'll get to it I think in bits and starts, but 
so much of this is the X-Men as a concept being haunted or assaulted by the concept of empire itself, Mm -hmm. uh, both internally and externally. And then also, um, well, just that, you know, and, and it's genocidal tendencies and also like, oh yeah. And then, and I guess all the emotional matrix that like the bad vibes that, that is, that are associated with, with empire it's, um, or that Morrison wishes to assign to empire, um, rightly or wrongly. Um, rightly. Yeah. Yeah. Rightly. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> um, yeah. So, okay. Let's, I guess we'll take it, uh, from the top. We got issue 122. We got the good. Um, Quite Lee's art is um, fucking on point again. But what I noticed, I like, I often try to think to myself, like, what what makes this fucking better than the other people? You know, we we this haunts us. We talk about it all the time. But I'd like to posit that like one of the elements that makes him better than anyone else is his capacity to like uh, illustrate shadow. Shadow plays very prominently in a lot of his images and particularly in new X-Men. But like this opening image where like Empress, the wheel is broken. The world is lost. There's this huge shadow. And it all like it all makes sense. Like it is it's 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 quite Lee's ability to to understand perspective. So. Wonderfully. Uh, yeah, well, it's like, funny. No, sorry. I was going to say we, we always talk about his perspective, but yeah, the shadow, the light, the his light sources being true. I, uh, yeah. I didn't pick up on that as like, we didn't talk about that as much as maybe we should have, but yeah, that, that's a big thing. Yeah. And we're going to, we'll see it, uh, later in, in later issues, a riot at Xavier. There's some excellent shadow work there and, and similarly through, throughout this. And I think that like, but that's a function of, of his work in perspectival work as well. Like he's able to get those light sources. So, well, because he's 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 it's from the perspective, right? Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's very it's very precise. Um, and then we see Morrison operating as a symbolist here. You know, Empress, the wheel is broken, the wheel of fortune. Um, uh, you know, uh, which the wheel of revolution, right? Like things are the empire is crashing. Um, and it's, it is one of those things that, you know, like Morrison likes to open up with that, that symbol, that mission statement thing, the world is lost. Uh, and that's very effective and Superman can't help this dude, you know, like in the Cape or whatever, like your, your average superhero guy now ain't going to do it. This is a job for the X-Men. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the steersman. That's uh, this this guy, right? Like the uh, yeah, he's steersman. The, yeah, I will not yield. Yeah, yeah. I love that. That Cassandra Nova's terrifying. Like, and I think um, I'm still angry at the Wolverine a Deadpool movie for like just yeah. misusing her. Uh, just like it, like they did not touch on like a tenth of like what she should be. But anyway, that's a uh, neither here nor there right now. But the uh, just that moment like become insane for me, and he's just like, ah, destroy your ship. And he does. Uh, it's awesome. They're all like, floating, yeah. like falling through space. Just, just desperate shit. Yeah. What is it? The, and Lelandra is, I like that her, this depiction of Lelandra as, as well. Like we, we often see her as well in, in uh, Chris Claremont's early run, like the X-Men team up with Lelandra to like retake the Shear empire. And she's much more of like kind of a warrior, but I, I think over time she just became Lelandra, right? Just the queen. Um, and you see kind of her badassness kind of in this, you know, like she's she's uh, the resistance, you know, the queen, ironically, even though she's like the, the queen. Um, but, yeah, this monster is uh, deceived and undermined the empire itself. Um, but I, there's, you know, like there's a there's a inability to understand the concept of empire within there, which I think you've already alluded to, Chris. Um, yeah. And she's very regal, like like people like smash doors so she can walk through, and like there's there's something about her. It, she's characterized well. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah. And then later you have uh, and, Scott's gonna go find Zorn, and you're establishing that that this body is booby trapped, and that they're she's basically killing Xavier. Yeah, I think we're skipping over a bit, uh, like a 
a little bit there, but the I love this giant explosion page, like like that's that's awesome. Quietly, these bodies in space, that's very cool. Um, oh, oh like they, the opening credits, sort of. Yeah, yeah. Nice, nice use of the credits. But before <laughs> before before Logan takes off, and I guess you already did kind of talk about this a bit, but like we're getting now we're zooming into the school. You know, we've seen Empire. Now we're getting back to the X Men, back to the school, and um. Xavier's sick at this time, and so Emma and Jean and everybody are trying to like pick up the slack. Um, now, is this when? Yeah, we want to learn from you. Your thoughts, you you know these they're like the teachers are trying like it's it's a Montessori kind of thing, I guess, right? You know, it is very uh, non hierarchical. Hierarchical. Um, it, at the very least, that's what Xavier hopes for, and mm-hmm. Emma is enacting here. Um, and- just situationally like a juxtaposition it's a contrast from that like you know the fallen empire to this sort of different model of of interacting or or being superior to others yeah yeah and like emma's never gonna lose all that shit you know like that that like that uh, blue blood money kind of thing um but yeah they're it is a different model Right. You know, like where, whereas it's um, rather than vertical, it's it's horizontal. And but I don't think that it I don't think it truly lives up to it. And I think uh, the, the unfortunate part about Riot at Xavier is it's immediately undermined like this. You I like we never. Well, no, we do see them. The children are the future in this story. Like the do they do come up with the plan that defeats Cassandra Nova. So I guess I should take that back. They they we do see that enacted but morrison's i'm jumping ahead but like he, they are quite quick to complicate it and i guess that's to their benefit but um yeah i kind of took it as like almost a like the fluid approach to learning just as sort of a you know that he was just sort of metaphoring that the that the school's approach to learning was going to be you know less what, what what are you guys saying? Um, Hierarchical, I, imperial, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 And, well, yeah. And, there's no and more. No one's getting yeah. whipped. You know. But I just I just took it as like that. That's just a that he just took like a quick snap of that. I I mean I I'm like I'm with you a little bit on that. I don't feel like it was really carried forward. No, not not in the way that you might like to see in in like a full on science fiction kind of story. You know, like let's go into the classroom at a certain point and let's see Emma learning something from someone. They 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 enact it during the fight with the supervillain, but not in the classroom. And I think that's consistent throughout. Um, but anyway, we'll we'll, we'll get there. Um, everybody's sick, even Logan. Uh, and I think we saw this that was stated before, but nobody looks sick. <laughs> nobody later when Corday's drawing Gene. them, they look fucking <laughs> sick. But um, I mean, but Gene nobody looks, looks sick. Hey, but Quietly's Gene. Well, Quietly's. I am so angry at but like this is like the one flaw it is he cannot draw. Her. Like it always looks like Charles in a wig. It's just weird. <laughs> <laughs> that's mm. really interesting yeah that's funny when you say it like that you're not i think that's quite Lee's problem is that he draws everybody that look you know like it's the steve we've talked about this before it's the steve dylan phenomenon you're like everyone looks like him you know it's like uh being john malkovich everybody it's true everybody, yeah everybody is frank quietly and frank quietly looks like professor xavier in a wig apparently uh, th- I, that's actually a fact yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so we got the marital strife with we uh, between uh, Jean and and Scott sort of. Um, they, they're worried about Jean because she has a she's shown the Phoenix Force. The Phoenix Force in in this is um, yeah much less terrifying than we've seen in the past, where you know I'm fire, I'm light, I'm gonna destroy a fucking sun kind of thing. Yeah, um, in would, this yeah. this story, oh sorry, I cut you off. No, no, this, no, no, no. This story feels more like they should just fuck off and listen to Jean. She's just telling them it's fine that she has full control of everything, and they're like, no, no. Yeah, um, you know, you kind of get why they don't, but uh, nonetheless, um, 
and yeah, and Scott's Scott's sort of like that. What does she say about him? You know, like you're you. Is she saying that your glowing eyes threat? You have to stop worrying that your glowing eyes threaten Republicans. Something like that. Is that? Yeah, there we go. We have more important things to do than worry about whether your our glowing eyes frighten the Republicans. Um, I don't know. Uh, well, I don't like. I know that there's Scott's concerns are our concerns nowadays. You know, it's it's remarkable. <laughs> Those clowns in Congress did it again. Right? <laughs> 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 it's true. Well, that that was re- like one page before with the school commentary. Is I feel like at this time they were sort of just sh- like his little jabs were like almost just sort of like a. Just like a shit, like I mean, they looked fancy with all his writing, but it's almost mm-hmm. just like a shallow way of saying the X Men are left wing. Let's move on, and then it's sort of he just like sort of skids across that, you know, as it being sort of like anti anti imperialist, anti capitalist, sort of free learning, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, all, we're... all accepting, <laughs> yeah, Which yeah, is well, an X Men thing, right? Yeah, I think they're yeah. being portrayed as a in in this. Um, so actually, Chris and I we were talking about this while you were getting gas. Well, we were driving that one time, but um, they're being presented as a mutual aid organization. Um, so, and we'll have uh, an, an ability to elaborate on this a little uh, later. But this idea, so Darwinian evolution, all that shit. You've got like you know your people are in a state of nature. Um, it's tooth and claw, uh, survival of the fittest, the fittest being the strongest, all that thing. And um, and there's a strain within anarchist literature, uh, Krup- Russian uh, anarchist literature. What's this guy, Kropotkin or whatever? He writes a book called Mutual Aid, and his argument is that um, a, a very important element of evolutionary um Progress, I suppose, uh, you know, if you want to use the word progress, um, is cooperation, mutual aid, helping each other, showing kindness towards each other and 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 supporting one another. Um, and the X-Men are being presented in a sort of like anarchist fashion in that way right now. You know, like what 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 Morrison's able to do in this that they haven't been able to do in any of their other works is try to actually like create show what an image of this anarchist ideal looks like um, that, that is alluded to in, in their other works. Uh, mm-hmm. And so I think that's what's going on here, you know, and, and really it's like, it's left lean, it's left leaning in, in, but it's like radically left. Uh, I, I think like beyond any spectrum in American politics. Yeah. I'd not put yeah. that together, but I think you're right about that. Yeah. I th- Especially for the time too, because later on he even he even uh, goes so far as to 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 say that have uh, Hank McCoy say that he might feels as though he may be gay, and even that that was uh, that's what ahead of its time really. Uh, well, not in comic. I mean, like we read the North Star comic. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah, but. Yeah, I don't know. He, yeah, he's but he is like there. He's pushing boundaries. I hate that fucking Hank McCoy saying he's gay thing. That, that really that's go ahead. Me. I wasn't even sure that that was like it almost seems like a moment. And I, I just don't know if it pays off later, but it sounds like no, it doesn't. He's just sort of like it, brushing off like, yeah, you, know, you know what? No, I can't date you anymore because actually I'm gay. Like it sounds like just an excuse almost. Yeah, no, it was a funny moment in like, but it's carried on like in okay. the later issues, like. Because Trish tells a story about it, like she's a reporter, like Frank McCoy is gay, you know, and it turns into like, anyway, it turns ridiculous and they talk about it all the time. And like, OK, yeah. And I well, not all the time, but later issues are going to devote some some time with Scott and uh, and Hank talking about it and Emma and Hank talking about it and Gene and Hank talking about it. Uh, you get the point. Um, mm. But it's funny. It's funny in this story because, uh, yeah, they're. Morrison's uh, d- like depiction of of gay and uh, transsexual individuals, you know, like that's that's nothing new. I mean, that's all very vertigo, right? It's 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 taking that vertigo um, ethic of of early Karen Berger um, comics and and just transplanting it into 2002. 
Uh, and so it's not really like ahead of its time, but it's trying to mainstream amongst like mainstream nerds. Uh, mm. and, hey, yeah, it's, it's, it's cool. It's normal, right? Yeah, well, maybe yeah. that's a better thing since like only yeah. 10 people read Vertigo comics. Well, exactly, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, just kidding. No, anyway, you're not, but yes, you're right. He's right. You're, I, I, I agree with you, though. It's, it's more of like an effort to like to mainstream a little edginess. Well, you're not wrong. Yeah. I mean, like Invisible's only lasted. I mean, it was by the skin of its teeth so much so that Grant got people to jerk off to a symbol in order to charge his magic or whatever. So that's uh. Oh, what yeah. the fuck? Yeah. Yeah, was, yeah. Well, we're looking. At, it's it the wasn't difference between. Right, so. Well. So new X-Men sells uh, issue 126 is going to sell over 100,000 issues. Um, the Invisibles to actually, you know, honestly, I've never I should look up the end. It's probably on this. I'll look it up later. But I can't imagine their numbers going over 20,000, 14,000, you know, something like that. They, they, they were never pulling uh, Sandman numbers. No. Um, um, no, n- neither was Peter Milligan, right? Like, I'm, al- I'm also thinking of Peter Milligan in this. Like, I just think early Vertigo work is very, very um, LGBTQ, et cetera. You know, like all the, all that stuff's there. Um, and whether or not it, it meets the standards of, of 2024 or whatever, fuck, not my, I don't care. But depictions were there, you know, like in an effort to tell stories were there. Um, and all that's happening here, to my mind, is just like uh, a publisher is willing to just give a, a major series of vertigo treatment. Um, and you're seeing like, not insignificant. No, no. Well, no, it's not. And it, and it, in, it, it seeds the future, like uh, in, in many ways, like, yeah. I mean, like you, you'll get, I'm sure, I'm sure there's a, a sizable portion of X-Men fans who look at Grant Morrison's run as the decline of civilization. <laughs> like, w- why can't we just have it the way it used to be when like, it was all like <clears throat> it was pretty it was pretty clear that like babes were <laughs> number one, man. Like, I'm just like, yeah, the, I don't want to assign uh, like I don't want to say it's Chris Claremont's fault, but his particular kinks didn't help anything. And his you know, his unwillingness or inability to depict uh, or, or to do anything more than just allude to a homosexual relationship between characters uh yeah yeah like i'm not he probably came the closest then to to anybody in in terms of like getting close to to an idea of representation but he never quite pulled the trigger like professor xavier you know and maybe chris claremont and professor xavier have a lot in common and they need uh there to be visited by their other yeah so um, we get, uh, what's that? What the, the issue before this psychic rescue in progress? Uh, it's, it's made redundant by this, this two page spread here when they explain everything that happened, uh, which leads me to think that like that silent issue just didn't need to happen. It was just put in unnecessarily. Still mad about that too. The challenge of the silent issue. What? Am I mad about it? I just I, no, I, I, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I find I find like as w- with age, I'm just like, wow, that really didn't need to happen. You know, like for the efficient clockwork nature of this story. No, nope. like it, it, it confirms what we said, which is just like it required two panels to be explained. Boom. And, you know, that's what happens. Uh, maybe three or four. Um, oh, I found a little cool thing. Chris, you'll like this. So they say that Cassandra trapped Xavier in the right hemisphere. Yeah, she trapped him in her brain's right hemisphere. Listen to this. Um, Okay, so it's associated with depression, the right hemisphere. Um, But it's also associated with something called Capgas syndrome, which is a fear of being replaced by your twin. Oh, man. Um, it, by like not just like family members being replaced by twins. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's a particular syndrome that uh, anyway. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I don't think for a moment that Morrison do that, but I was like, wow, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Happy accident. Yeah. yeah. Cool. For, no, what Morrison's aiming at is this this fucking stupid relation, this this pop culture idea that there's a distinction between the left brain and the right brain. And one's more abstract and one's more logical. Um, that's the sort of coding that we're getting here. 
Um, I, as you can tell from my tone, I have no patience for that because uh, the brain fucking works as a brain. It's a whole thing, man. You know, like there's no such thing as left brain, right brain. <laughs> Like, I'm sure there's some, like, clearly there's some things that are associated with left and right, like using your left hand, for instance, probably has something to do with some part of your brain. Um, but anyway. Um, I, it's I just, true. It's, it's funny that, like, the, it's true, though, you're saying that because usually you get, like, that rhetoric that 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 a left-handed person is completely functioning on the entire right side of their brain or something. Yeah, yeah. So that they're that they're they're so artistically inclined that their body is completely controlled by the right side of their brain that they're inept at math and 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 fluid in all art forms. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, yeah. All that wait shit a sec, that's a... fucking. I use my right hand for everything. <laughs> also, <laughs> just because a fucking pencil feels comfortable in that hand doesn't mean that my the other side of my brain doesn't work at all. Um, yeah, that's not logical. Um, and it's yeah, yeah. funny. It's funny that that was just like an accepted way of talking about it, even in school, even teachers. Absolutely, it's, all, it's, it's so bizarre. Everywhere you go, yeah. I'm a visual learner. I'm a. I'm more of a left hemisphere guy. No, no, you're not. You're just you're just using these categories like astrology. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> funny. Um, funny to think. so anyway. Yeah, so she's tra- but but what's the symbolism here? You know, she's trapped. Um, uh, Professor X, uh, away from the logic centers, away from like the the self control centers, and in these like realms of abstract thought, you know, like we saw in Psychic Rescue, it's all very primordial, it's all very abstract, you know, just like the this this pop culture notion would expect us to to find. Um, yeah. Um. Yeah, and so they're hoping. Yeah, the the uh, fucking the Shi'ar are coming. Or wait, they're, they're talking about how she's like only only mimicking human traits. I thought about generative AI actually. Um, I don't have a larger thought about that, but she's a living. Yeah, they're talking about like what Cassandra is. She's living emotional energy. Uh, and this mm-hmm. idea that the world and the womb are the same thing, uh, and they're battling, you know for control of the womb which is like cerebra and stuff i don't know like i i know what morrison's aiming towards in that story it's that um it's that fucking stanislav guy groff it's that oh, whole okay. fucking groff thing but i like i don't right, right, right. i don't know if it adds anything it's it, but it's that's what's going on uh, there i like the giant uh, superimposed scowling baby though as they have that conversation it's cool Oh, yeah, like, like, yeah. yeah you're right yeah it's all angry and stuff yeah um living yeah yeah, yeah. formless immense that, and totally unique yeah i just kind of like i don't want to nitpick at it but I, like that whole conversation yeah like she appears educated in intelligence how could you mimic that like that's God. well that's what made me think of generative ai right yeah yeah that's a good point yeah yeah. yeah, like like you can mimic these things just through algorithm. You know, you can appear to be any number of things just by like tapping and and they have like vast psychic ability to to just suck from the their surrounding. And so like they're, you know, we, the, Morrison and none of us would have had the language or, or thoughts to th- this new metaphor that's been born. But like it's kind of like generative AI. Um, but like this this. um this well but like highly emotionally charged and and bad vibes man and like that might be generative ai too i don't know <laughs> yeah i hope it starts attacking our self-esteem that would be, that'd be yeah shit. oh mm. we can ask it to play like pretend you've got good vibes though and it'll pretend it has good vibes so it's it's not doesn't quite fit um i'd love to ask ai like tell me Write me a letter in the style of Grant Morrison. I bet I could just really take the piss right out of him. <laughs> <It's really funny. laughs> uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna change Nora's uh, bedtime story that I wrote about a frog oh, no. wizard, and I'm gonna make it right in the style of Grant Morrison for the next installment for you. Yeah, yeah, I would love to. I'd love to know about that. Um, okay, yeah. So we're taking a lot of time. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. It's this is my fault. But there's so much going on and. Uh, like this this is the stuff that i especially love like and there's bits of action between now and the end that that can be probably glossed over but getting to the zorn thing uh 
I, once again, man, wait, is Magneto just sitting in a fucking cell? Just well, his Tibetan pals just, you know, like, and he's just hoping the X-Men are going to pick him up one day and make him join, like, again and yeah, again. Yeah. I'm so he's, like, afraid. meditating. He's hanging out. It's yeah, it's just so healing a bird. He's healing yeah. birds. Yeah. That's no, he you knew. Know. He knew they were coming. Oh, I'm sure he did. He yeah. knew Scott would need him. Mm-hmm. They're in the like, meat yeah. I like the uh, the Zorn Scott like bromance adventure thing happening here though. Yes! Like they fucking go so to space. Cool. They're like yeah, wrecking shit up. Scott's quipping. It's really fun. Yeah, yeah. No, I like I loved Zorn. I loved Zorn so much. And like just like um, the other characters, like later on, they're gonna be like, we want Zorn to come back. <laughs> and like yeah, <laughs> let's have Zorn come back. He was awesome. Like Zorn was the promise of new X Men. Like, and, you know, we'll have an opportunity to talk about this some, some more later, but th- this concept, like, th- that we could finally get into something like some truly hippie bullshit with uh, with new X-Men and, and, and put forward, like, some new ways of seeing the world and stuff like that. There yeah, was, it would be so know. appropriate in this in, in the X-Men. Yeah. Um, it's so that. appropriate that that's ripped yeah. away from you, though. Oh, <laughs> that's also is. true yeah and it is like like again i i'm i'm pretty excited to talk about that element of it because it is uh it is a hell of an inversion uh and having reread it i was like wow okay actually like oh, it's like wow really fuck you claremont's back yeah yeah well no it was really fucking dumb. <laughs> it remains fucking dumb to this day but i was like okay you know fine i'll roll with it <laughs> Speaking of rolling with it, uh, we're gonna go over to the next issue. We got Ethan Van Skyver in the house. Skiver. It was very good here. Yeah, yeah. it's fantastic yeah. actually. Um, I I also loved. I appreciate that. There's like, basically, this is like Gene's speech to the press uh, about like their utopian vision and like the what what you a mutant world could look like if if people are allowed to flourish. And it basically comes down to this this moment where that reporters like you know like some of us are, are on your side and she's like well maybe maybe some of us should start talking to others and it's like it's an allyship moment and yeah. i love that van skyver has to like preside over this <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point that's and also one of the most emotional beats like when gene gene's in the thing with the um, professor you know and she's trying to figure out like a, you know she's like it's beautiful charge this world did you and she figures out who Gus the dog was. You know, she's like, why does he, well, he's been calling me Gus, Moira and Gus. I don't understand. And then you find out, you know, like it's it's actually pretty affecting. Um, and Ben Skeever, he, like I said it before, I'll say it again, like his characters emote well. Um, um, can we sorry, I, there was something I wanted to point out. We're going to rewind slightly. I'm Good. so sorry. Um, they said that Cassandra Nova, Nova booby trapped her body. Um, I forget if we talked about this, about issue 115. There's a point where, James, you may re- recall this, when um, Cassandra Nova, for reasons that we don't understand, injects something into her neck as she's talking to the X-Men. Oh, yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, and you're like, oh, you don't think anything of it. That's her booby trapping her body. That's when it happens. Um, way back in issue 115 with that with that injection that you just kind of like don't pay attention to because the scenario is so fucking weird anyway. But that's yeah, like I'm pretty it. sure Wolverine's just drilling an arm through her at one point. A couple panels after that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's when they're like she's roasting their bodies and stuff, right? She's just about to roast their bodies with the Sentinels. Um. So, but yeah, you're right. Like it's oh, there's so much yeah. going on that you don't even notice. Um. So I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, and then you you find out it's only to to give herself basically like degenerative mental Nanosin. diseases and yeah and, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. And yeah shit so that she can like roast Charles while while he's in her half mutilated yeah. corpus carcass yeah energy. which is crazy like like you know when they're 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 saying like Emma she's thought of, she's seeing everything at a higher level like she has almost like a um almost a Morrisonian like understanding of the plot that's about to occur. Uh, and mind you, like the, I'll, no, I was just gonna say I'll, I'll skip way ahead and say I feel like all of that is cheapened by the X Men being like that's exactly what she wants us to do when they're well, going I, to I repair don't, the body. 
but maybe it isn't. Maybe maybe <laughs> maybe what maybe what Cassandra Nova knows is this typical superhero plot, uh, and not not the thing that they won't do. You know, like they it, there's these it, it as a generative AI, it has a certain sort of algorithm. It expects things. It it predicts things based on your past actions, and so you can just fuck it up by like. Asking it about things it doesn't have any understanding of, or doing or doing something that it doesn't expect, uh, something out, radically outside the algorithm, like letting the children come up with a plan to defeat the enemy. Um, hmm. So, like, I, I don't know if it, but it, but it, like, you really I don't know if it deserves say, all that. I, well, I, sadly, <laughs> probably not. You know, like, I, I still think that I still think that's maybe what's happening. Okay, back to Ben Skyver. Pardon me. Um, I love Emma <laughs> talking with Gene. Yeah. Well, that's all very civil of you, Gene. Only when you would use the words "terrific bunch" to dignify this horrid, this horde of ghastly illiterates. Uh, it's fucking fantastic. <laughs> Emma's so good. I, I love that. It's kind of, I don't know. I picked up on this more this time, but like, just her mm. psychic power is just like tuned to like rooting out people's perviness and like just using it against them. It, it's like an interesting twist on telepathy uh, or, you know, he uses it as a weapon always. And it's a good contrast to Jean. Uh, yeah. Jean, you know, Jean is like, Hey, they're all a terrific bunch, you know, because she's very much Xavier, like, and we'll have lots more time to talk about this in the future as well. But this idea that telepathy makes you like uh, empathy, right? Um, there's telepathy plus empathy with Jean with, uh, Emma, there is telepathy plus minus empathy, you yeah, know, or, or like, or, well, yeah, or, or I guess plus lust, you yeah, know, like, or power more, maybe, but like, yeah, yeah, it, but, it, but it's tempered, you know, it's like, she's a bad girl, you know, like she's, but she's not, she used to be a villain and you kind of get that from her, like the, like the, the past. Um, but she's a typical sort of X-Men reformed villain. Uh, although you don't see Rogue like being villainous, you know, even though she was once like a bad person. Um, Emma's very, yeah, kind of the dark yeah. side of. I was more of like an ass than than, <laughs> than really than really like villainous. I would say, mm-hmm. like she's just she's just rude. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't because I don't I don't know I don't know that she's actually like like does anything that's like an actual like liability to them like in that in that villain sort of vein you know yeah yeah no you're not wrong yep um yeah and she genuinely cares about her students you know and she has her little acolytes or whatever she's she builds a gang uh she she's the sort of person who like builds a clique around her uh and teaching is all about building a clique you know having all these like mini versions of her uh and Morrison's wise to play off of that, much, you know, later, especially in Riot at Xavier's. Um, but we're, we're uh, we haven't talked to, like we the cuckoos showed up last time. And here we're starting to see them uh, being sort of broken up in the most hilarious way possible. Uh, Esme, Kato. Yeah, yeah, Esme and Kato. <laughs> Can we? I think it's in this issue. It's like, but yes. you read me poetry. You said we were in love. And he's like, and like a fool, you believed me. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, yeah. It's like the fucking greatest. Uh, despite the connotation of like space blob, weird, like um, sex fiend, uh, like coming after these like teenage girls, like they just kind of mm-hmm. gloss over. But like, yeah, Kato's fucking uh, monster well kato becomes but but he well, becomes stu- the, he's a protoplasm he's stuff and he's the thing that solves the problem right you know like he's a bad boyfriend that they get their revenge on and beat the bad guy with yeah it's pretty and josh, like, we- joss whedon it's pretty fucking funny oh it's really <laughs> funny yeah he's like yeah. He, they're just like tormenting him like now you're the perfect boyfriend as he's like just sort of like forced into his blob form and just being bullied by these five super te- telepaths yeah, yeah. Uh, I love that Morrison takes the piss out of Gladiator's entrance, too. He's literally there to, like, commit mutant genocide. Destroy all the mutants, and she's like, try not to let this experience put you off, boys, Esme. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. stupid. No, yeah, it's it, but it's fucking funny, and it's it comes off really well. Like, like again, the... Uh, 
there's there's a lot of humor baked into this in in a way that you kind of wouldn't expect, but probably like definitely should expect. Um, Morrison likes to open up with a symbol and end off with like a cliffhanger, maybe and maybe a joke. That's definitely what we're seeing here. Um, before that, um, we see oh, there's a couple things like the when uh, Gene's presenting to the press, right? Um, there, you know, we're we're getting this this vision of the X Men, and again, this is one of the reasons I I love these issues so much because so much like a lot of this is going to get lost later. Um, but just talking about you know what it's like to to be a telepath and what it's like to look at human nature. He saw deep down we're all scared of being hurt or betrayed by one another, and you know like that's 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 what Gene's telepathy is, you know, like and Professor X's telepathy and the philosophy that grows out of that. And I really admired that. That meant a lot to me when I when I was a kid reading this, I, like and so much of Morrison's work. But this in particular, I was like, oh yeah, there's a lot of truth to that. And you know, I've carried, I've tried to carry that with me. Um, but at the same time, there's also like sort of a cynicism. You know, it sometimes seems like everyone wants to be a persecuted mi- minority these days, but the uh, institution tries not to encourage that kind of defeatist worldview. Um, you the, like at this at the same in the same breath there's sort of a try not to whine uh chuck dixon attitude kind of you know baked into that like i know morrison's trying to be empowering but like there's and and it's not fun it's not a fun thing it's not good to put in your superhero comic to for characters who who feel weak and and disempowered and that's not the purpose of superheroes uh, according to Morrison, but it kind of glosses over the the importance of recognizing that I don't know people are victims yeah. and need to heal, you know, and like yeah, and the I, kids don't just want to be. Um, I because uh, sorry, I'm talking a lot, but that's a that's something that people worry about, you know, like especially with this the with transgender issues, they're like, well, just everybody just kind of wants to be gender fluid nowadays it's just a fad with the kids you know they just want to be persecuted they want to be special I'm like no I'm like that's fucking dumb that's yeah dumb there attitude. is a little there yeah. is a little like little edge on that like victim culture right yeah, yeah yeah it just shows the limit of i guess like 2002 progressive um you know i guess uh discourse or vision you know there's uh the conversation like that was sort of the extent of it i guess uh and we had we had less ability to tap into other people's perspectives. Yeah. I, I, I know, well, there's two things to that. Like one, it's ironic because we're talking about like telepaths. Um, and, and, you and th- but that's not like, Morrison's yeah, fault. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, exactly. But the second thing is like, I, and I'll, I'll maintain this and I have maintained this in the past. I think there's something retrogressive in Morrison's hippie anarchist attitude. I, I think that, um, and I've, I've said this in our uh, invisibles, chat and i think it's i think it's present here as well um the you know everything everything streams towards neoliberalism in the corporation uh in in some way somehow uh and it's a fatal flaw in in morrison's work particularly at this time because like we're gonna probably we're gonna be able to talk about this a little bit more later but we've already seen it in the x-men annual like what does what does what has the X-Men done? It's become X Corp, you know, and it's very true. Uh, this mutual aid organization is, is centered around this concept of big money and um, corporate offices, franchises throughout the nation. Um, we're, we're, you know, like it's a, it's, it's this parody of a mutual aid organization uh, in, in a, in, in the way you would exactly expect, you know, from someone who just fucking takes, takes it hog wild from DC and Marvel whenever like whenever the like the money presents itself because they're hoping to do something good with with mainstream franchise but like yeah and you know what's interesting the, too yeah. is that uh it just occurred to me that like this sort of comes from that fixation on magic um and esoteric exploration and it all comes from that idea that you know corporate symbols are a sigil that are put into the world that can affect change um, yeah. And we need to tap into that. And it's just kind of funny how um, I just side sidetrack, but like the um, how often magic just often sort of leads into those sorts of realms of like, I don't know, um, like cash grabbing or 
Yeah, well, what's the first (laughs) the first spell that anyone casts is how do I make money and how do I get women or men to want sure sure yeah you know or or what have you you know like it's it's about glamour and about desire and it's about like fulfilled desire and like what is what is capitalism (laughs) it's about glamour Mm, and fulfilled desire (laughs) marketing and advertising and like that all that illusion yeah that's that's interesting yeah. Anyway, we don't need to go down those routes, but I think I think no. that that essential contradiction in Morrison is is a present and beginning to be present um, in these issues and will become more present as we proceed. Can we fucking talk about nano sentinels now? Because I know. Oh, yeah, <laughs> guys are I like that. Fucking... They look like the ones from the island. Yeah, they look like little sentinels. You're like, you're like, okay. <laughs> um. It's one way to handle it. They yeah. kind of look like shrimp too. That's I yeah. like that. Little fucking shrimp hanging Some out there. Monkeys, yeah. So, um, where did that Sentinel program come from? Right? It's a it's a covert American uh research program in South America. It is American imperialism, right? And so this is again, this is like this is literally like these embodiments, these symbols of imperialism have entered in like literally into their bodies like and are attacking them from within. Um, and this is where I, I got the illusion or the comparison. And Chris, you'll know what I'm talking about to the House of Fun when um, King Mob's being tortured and they and the the the, uh, the archons show up and everything turns poisonous. And, and Morrison's experiencing sepsis at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so were all these people like later on, they're like, you've got blood poisoning. Um, it's, it's, it's King mob in the house of fun, uh, with the archons showing up. And so, um, Cassandra Nova is, is one of the archons kind of showing up into the world. Oh, and her yeah, herald, yeah. Her heralds are the nano sentinels, right? That um, is a good way to look at Cassandra Nova. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Sentinel and and then like later on, they're going to say Sentinel enriched liquid is what drove you men technology. So like everything, it's just like this, this um, empire is really inf- infecting everything. And it, like the entire X-Men comic uh, up until the very end is is going to kind of be haunted by these like those first issues of the X-Men um, accidentally. Well, not accidentally, probably on purpose, but, you know, delivered badly by the end. Um, but yeah, everybody's dying. So James, you probably don't know this. Um, Morrison, while writing in the Invisibles, he uh, he got really sick. Uh, they got really sick, and they were writing about like how the bad guys like infected reality and caused like an abscess in reality. And he was, incidentally, at the same time, also experiencing an abscess. You know, like he they they claim they had no idea. There was like you know, it's art making life happen to him. Um, and so what they did is they wrote their way out of their sickness. You know, they wrote a story about how they overcome the abscess and, and the, the sickness and the, the disease in reality uh, and, you know, and got out of it. Um, I don't care about the reality of it, but I just like that's what's going on here. Morrison's just echoing that whole. So he's like, like riffing off of the, the story yeah, yeah. that he used in The Invisibles. Yeah, yeah. Um. As every writer, <laughs> as many writers do, they just tell the same story over and over. And um, he was able to sort of uh, future predict imperialist COVID. Yeah, it, yeah, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> OK, so then we get the Corday, Corday issues. Uh, oh, God. You know what I love most about the Corday issues? Is Zorn's like when every time you show they show Zorn and there's steam coming out of his head. And he just looks like um, fucking ridiculous. Uh, He's like venting some gas. I get that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, you have like a little steam engine sound in your mind. Well, there's okay. one issue and there's well, one image in it. particular. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna send you a picture of it, but it's fucking yeah. It's just like. <laughs> um, what do we do with these these two issues? There's there's some cool stuff in there, but it looks like fucking hot garbage. Yeah, I like that. Um, like increasingly, you get like all these rhetor- the rhetoric and um, like language of of fascism, and particularly like the the ideas of like disease, contamination, um, 
what what does gladiator say uh the empire has been uh well there's talk about infection for sure yeah even lalandra says we'll root out the mutant plague at its source we'll preserve what we can and then the other little light bulb head guys like he speaks blasphemies you should not hear Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's 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 like a yeah it's like a court of i don't i don't know it's almost like a warhammer court (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) that's that again that's why i always kind of hate the shiar but um the um yeah the empire's polluted that's another one that that is so like it's just like these are such common tropes in in fascist discourse like the looking at the other as as disease as something that needs to be cut out or eliminated or cancer that sort of thing um and mm-hmm. I, I think it's very very consciously adopted here by morrison and has been since cassandra nova like early on you know like we, we yeah. must exterminate the mutant germ line et cetera. Et cetera sterilization um, like they won't say genocide yeah. but that's clear like they're they have a squad that goes into planets and like destroys entire populations <laughs> yeah yeah like the people that show up uh early on at the school so, and just the blue guys talking shit and gets lobotomized by Wolverine. yeah yeah i, yeah. I guess you know, i gotta say beyond lobotomy that's he has had his brain like vivisected from him yeah that's just done just skewered I think the art isn't as bad in these, like, or like the uh, issue 124. Like, it's there's moments that are bad, but then there's ones that are like, like the Shear ones. Like something about being in the Shear Empire. Like Corday just can't fucking draw it. Like when they're like she spits on <laughs> like Cyclops. Like what am I looking at? Uh, um, yeah. But when they get to the school, like, I, like I, I feel like they had a bit more time to draw things. Like. The terrestrial, I th- maybe Corda just feels better in that realm. Like they're not a sci-fi artist, I don't think. Um, and you have to admire, you know, like even this this art being so poor, like e- the amount of work that went into drawing this crowd. So I'm looking at the issue, the the so the he this the lady gets skewered, um, the. Uh, Emma's gotten saved by the uh, the kids, but then you know, then we turn the page, a few pages, and we've got Gene and uh, Hank leading all the reporters and stuff. And look at each of the reporters; they're all individuals. Each one is given an actual like emotional state and persona and action, and they all feel like real bodies moving in space. And I know it's drawn not to the standard that you would expect from a Marvel or, or a mainstream comic, like, like, but frankly, there's a way in which it's like beyond the standard. Um, there's a, there's a competence that generally isn't actually demonstrated in most comics. Like it's, it's a weird, it's a weird juxtaposition. Cause you're like, this sucks, but you're like, yeah, it looks could've, like they could have been better. It looks like they colored a, a, what do you call it? Like a, like a template, like a thumbnail. Yeah, that's what the book looks like. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, it's all sketched. It's like you know, it's done in two weeks. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Um. Anyway, you think I just I wanted to give no him one look. work there except for this guy, I guess. Yeah. Um. Just I wanted like to him. give him little pro- <laughs> little props, but go on. I like that you get some good beast. I I love beast and uh, you get some really good moments here, like when when um they're you know trying to like steer all the reporters and he's like if it's any consolation they're they only murder mutants so you'll all be fine right right (laughs) it's very humane and like just kind of like you know really trying his best to reassure everybody even even the midst of us like figuring out that they're like billions of sentinels in their blood and uh being attacked from all sides He's given some real great combat prowess too in in these issues. Oh, beast! Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's beaten up. Well, of course, like it, yeah, like it, no, that you're right, and that's nice. You know, he's fighting like the the um, Justice League essentially, or like I don't know, the Legion of it's the Legion of Superheroes is who they're actually who they're fighting, uh, who the um, the Shear Empire was was built off of, and and Gene like beats the shit out of that person too. That's nice to see. Yeah, that's actually that's actually one of the only cohesive sort of action sequences that he draws. 
Yeah, yeah. Where I kick, can see elbow, like I can yeah. see the kick. I can mm-hmm. see the elbow follow up, and then the the palm strike to the nose, and then the cool like matrix pose afterward. Nicely done. Uh, sort of a three panels treat. Yeah, Four. yeah. Four. Yeah, yeah. But then then she looks like, and then she looks sick, right? And she should. Uh, cause she's like, Hey, you know, she's talking about how she has a fever and everybody's like not doing well. Um, you're right though. The, 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 they're not passing the Frank Miller test here. Like the Frank Miller daredevil test where you can like follow the action or even the Frank quietly test, right? Which is a high burden. You don't want to like compare everything to that, but you should know what's happening. Like when beast is fighting people, I don't know what's happening. He smashes people with a statue. Maybe. Definitely I don't know who's that. smashing. Yeah, but who? No, I don't know. <laughs> what who. body? I have no idea. Um, getting back to what you were saying, Chris, about the um, sort of fascist rhetoric that's that's being evoked. I, I like uh, Zorn's like Scott is my friend. What world? What is this world of liars? And you know, like that's exactly what we see. That's another element of. It's not just that the fascists talk about, and we see this nowadays with racist grandpa and everything. They're fucking liars. They're just fucking liars. They're liars, hate-filled liars. Um, and they they evoke certain traits or tropes like as old as the fucking hills. And it's it never ceases to frustrate me because they're just fucking liars. And you know, they're just like, well, no, you're the liar. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what to do with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're the liar, but whatever. Fine. That's what a liar would say. Um, yeah. So, and then the next one. Uh, yeah, what does happen in the next one? I think it's like a lot of action. Like, it's really unfortunate that, like, Corday is put in charge of the action. Yeah, I think that was the killer part is there's, like, there's some Wolverine beast moments that just would have died to see mm-hmm. them executed well like from an action standpoint and then, and then there's this yeah i like seeing um the yeah the, the important things that happen here is that the the kids are all coming together like the the kids are basically um the original x-men in different form uh you know you've got Beak, who is like a, a Cyclops kind of character. Uh, Angel is Angel. Um, the uh, the Cuckoos are Jean Grey. You know, like the, the, Morrison's going to kind of play with these, you know, going back to the original 1960s X-Men uh, squad thing. Um, the Cuckoos are going to escape from that, but like early on there, that's kind of what's happening. And so like the, it, it's like, if that's the case, then it's not really the fact – it's not really that the youth are are teaching anything to the present. It's that it's that the, the youth are reenacting the youth of the adults. <laughs> like, and and some, there's something regenerative about that. There's something, something that allows you to overcome hate by just like being like your parents when they were kids. Or like your teachers when they were kids. And maybe there's some truth to that. Maybe not. I don't know. But reminding I, them that they were once young or slightly. I suppose so. You know, like the idealism of youth. But it's the particular structure that that is, you know, and I know it's a superhero comic. So like reiteration and prismatic, um, uh, uh, you know, re- repetition is is really important to the to your typical f- superhero franchise, you know, like um Sell sell everybody something new, but just make sure that they knew, feel that it's old, um, and probably yeah, make it old. It's probably better. Yeah. Uh. So anyway, but it's still kind of cool. It's watch. It's cool watching these the young kids like the new the new mutants. Essentially, they do come up with a plan. Like they save yeah. Emma. They save everybody. They're just like they they stole the DNA. Um. They've got the body. They're ready to do everything. Um. Like they they've got Cassandra on the ropes. And it's a fun no, dynamic and, yeah, too. Yeah. It's a fun dynamic, like in that uh, you know, like the like angels just trying to act tough and like worldly, and they're like, you've never done drugs before. Like, uh, yeah. they, they just see right through her. And then when they when they spring Beak, like he's just like, it's very important that I trans that I process my trauma over the next the last couple of days. And um, then when uh, when they're talking, 
angel's kind of goading him saying uh you know she'll she'll eat your brain so she's gonna turn you all out and he's like well let her try if she was me for one hour like she'd kill herself slit her own yeah. throat because like yeah like look at me like, well, my, have, like, my, this... well my youthful depression you know like it like can take on the cosmic depression of existential dread you yeah. know like yeah there's there's it it's uh yeah it's funny it's it's not just funny like i think there's something contained in that though like I, well I, they they skirt around that with scott too right she she they have like a show to he has like a show yes with xavier yeah. after yep. after um what cassandra sort of eats um the mm-hmm. lander off the cliff or, or yeah, off yeah. the balcony oh, or whatever yeah. and thorn mm-hmm. saves her with no ability to fly Yes. <laughs> so I'm not sure about that, but and it works out. Um, yep, and, fine. and then, uh, and strangely cohesive. And as all the shit I talked about this earlier, but, uh, but yeah. And then they have like the showdown where she basically just like shames him and tells him he should just kill himself and get it over with. And Scott's like, I like that he overcomes it by being like just perpetually depressed, shitty Scott. It's like, it has no effect on him. <laughs> Well, that yeah, yeah. It's, you could, like you could tell me to kill myself all the time. It's fine. I'm Scott. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <Yeah, but laughs> well, Scott's a, Scott's the fucking worst. Okay, like and again, we're gonna have an opportunity to talk about this later. But like, <laughs> it's not the first time he's abandoned his wife for an analog to his dead. Lo- you know, like he's like he's got a thing that he does, um, and yeah, he's he's got to deal with it. Um, oh, sort Scott. of like it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he decides in this moment, like, like it, it, it's kind of funny because, like, he says in this, we're led to understand in this moment that actually he could have defeated Cassandra, but he would have had to have killed Professor X. Like, he 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 walked up to her and he understood it and he he gauged the defenses and he realized, well, there's no way I can do this without killing Professor X, so I'm gonna stop. Um, and I'm gonna come up with another fucking plan, right? Um. I love the opening and I'm skipping ahead to the, the opening to issue 126. Uh, you know, you have no doubt we can survive this. None at all. Like we've got fucking the best. We yeah, got the Captain awesome. America of X-Men coming it's at true. us. You know, he, logic yeah. would dictate he should have killed Professor Xavier. Sure. Yeah. But that's, you know, but then. It's not yeah. the X-Men style, you know, I guess. And it and it doesn't suit yeah, like it's not it's not just that but it it doesn't suit Morrison's um uh reason for writing these superhero comics which is to infect nerds and seed popular culture with this like um lateral th- this idea that you can think laterally around an issue like you know hmm. like you you can over you can overcome uh existential dread through hope that's a real and thing it, that you can have right yeah and you can, you can execute it, and here's heroes executing it. You should help each other. That's good too. Yeah, and it like it's explicitly addressed when like the students ask, like, "Are you going to kill her?" And Jean's like, "Well, I have to think about that. Like, it's, it goes against everything we've ever taught. There's got to be a better way." So like at least yeah. there's an engagement. I mean, not not that that's an uncommon thing. Like it, it's been done a million times with Batman. Like, why don't you just kill the Joker? But um, yes, yeah, yeah. I did think of that when um, I thought of the Joker actually in two ways. I thought of that, that moral qualm that always, always exists um, in, you know, but also that I Morrison's going to take this up later with um, uh, in, in their Batman run. It's, it's later going to be said that like the Joker doesn't recognize Bruce Wayne. It's just Batman. And like, those are the two individuals in the universe. Um, I think there's an echo in there actually. Um Oh we'll yeah, that's that, that they explicitly say that about Cassandra Nova and Charles. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, Morrison just finds other ways to to just do these things later. But yeah. Um, I and, and yeah. Going back a little bit. Um, sure. Like Lilandra, uh, like I love the the opening of the issue where like she's just gone full fanatic. Like if you love me, die for me. Yeah. Make the empire burn in a glorious pyre. Make war in my glorious name. Um, and then Cassandra's behind her, just say like, I think her advisor's trying to like talk her out of it, and he's just she's just saying, 
underneath the laws and rules of every civilization, a snarling beast prowls, straining at its chains. I only set the beast of empire free and it tears and let it tear the stars apart. And that is that is that like that implication that in all empire, in all sort of like dominance, there is that strain that, uh, you know, the, call it genocidal, call it fascist or even just like colonial, but the, that is waiting to, to come out or emerge and, and spiral towards death. I think that's yeah. looking at Morrison's politics in general, like there, there's that it's that concern of like, how do you how does a revolution avoid that? And that that touches very much so back to Invisibles as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's like it's very Freudian, you know, like like underneath the ego, uh, the superstructure is the id and the id mm, the is like drive. the death drive yeah. and all that shit. Um, and like I can't um, I've read some things which we don't need to get into, but I mean, like there's, there's lots of reasons to think that like Freud's conception of the death drive is perhaps flawed. Um, and that, you know, it like, it's an interesting idea and it makes sense. Like it's, it's sort of a Manichaean worldview that, that, that would please us, you know, like there's good and there's bad, there's the death drive and there's Eros. Um, and it makes a lot of sense to, to be employed in, um, in Morrison's, uh, you know, because he's a symbolist, right? And he's very interested in like these these uh, these dyads, right? Um, anyone who's interested in this idea, though, this this idea of like uh, the um, how sort of violence works in empire. Uh, very recently, like just just very recently, a book was published called uh, they called it Peace: uh, Worlds of Imperial Violence. Uh, by Lauren uh, Benton, who's a, a historian, uh, a legal historian, who studies this book is about small wars, um, what we like, you know, or, or never ending wars or whatever. And it's very much about how it's not very much. It is about how empire uh, perpetuates itself or or spreads violence through these. These liminal conflicts that are not war and are not peace, you know, like you think about what goes on in Afghanistan and, and what went on in uh, ir- Iraq and, and just throughout the world. And, but not just with America, like everywhere. Um, it is, it is something that, that functions um, it, it, like Imperial, like imperialism, like goes out there and like commits violence. Uh, that's it's, it's constituent element um, and it, it sustains it. Uh, and I think this book does a much better job of describing like how that works in history than than like than Mark and Morrison can ever gesture to. Uh, so just, you know, anyone who's interested and you know wants to not think about the world in Jungian or Freudian terms that you don't have to. Uh, there's there's you know, historians will help you. Um, yeah. So. What happens at the end of this issue? Um, they're going to save uh, this is this gets back to your thing Chris, uh, James like yeah uh, Hank's about to, to administer the, the cure or whatever and Jean's like no it's bad and so she starts coming up with their plan which is a pretty cool plan where she's going to yeah because she's in her like yeah like you said no, we're going to we're going to save Xavier in half of my brain and then not revive that cassandra nova body because it's going to be a problem yeah um and it's cool like like this this um amalgamation of Jean and and charles uh through her like bloodied eyes and bloody nose and stuff like that like it's it's such a cool image and it's it's funny that i can hear like you hear um quietly is going to cheat a little bit and make Jean look especially xavier-esque Corday doesn't do that because Corday doesn't have time to fuck around. Um, it just looks like Gene, like badass Gene, but you can hear Xavier's words. It sounds like him, you know, and like, I know this is kind of a good of a stupid thing to say, but Morrison, that's what, that you can't just do that. He just does it with words. That's really good. <laughs> like, I know that's mm-hmm. dumb. Um, it's just, yeah. And, but also the, the transition between Gene and, and Xavier. Uh, you can hear her and then you can hear him and it goes back and forth and the little comment, Hank to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just like, it's, she's like all of a sudden like issuing orders. So it's more Xavier stepping up front. Yeah. Everywhere. All the ones it's time. I see her. 
Hello, Charles. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, whatever. So then we get there's to, barfing. Yeah. yeah. Well, then then we get issue 126, which is just a fucking tour de force. Um, yeah. And and okay, so what makes this especially good? We got one inker. So previously we've seen a couple acres and you, they got away with it, but you could see a little difference from panel to panel. But in this case, Tim Townsend is in the house throughout the entire fucking thing. The coloring's on point. Um, Quitely's on point. Morrison's on point. This is fucking beauty. Uh, no up. backgrounds. So, nice and clean. No backgrounds. We don't need a fucking background. What do you need a background for? No, it's too good for that. <laughs> well, no. Oh, okay. Well, you, you kind of get like okay. So you open it, the the opening image is kind of like a Tim Tim Bradstreet background, right? It's just <laughs> like a brick brick walls as far as the eye can see. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's not fair. Then then you get like the explosions in the background. Everything's good. You get a bunch of trees. No, uh, no, you haven't got to the end of the issue yet. Okay, well, we'll get there. You're, you're. I know what you're talking about. Like backgrounds become like less existent as the action increases, but. Um, but that's okay. I don't know. For him, I like let it slide though, because Wolverine just looks so cool, and everybody's. Doing I think their thing. I think you're wrong. I'm looking through it right now. I, th- I think you're exaggerating. I think that Mm-mm. there. Uh, I think at a, at certain points, backgrounds disappear because, I think it's a choice. I, f- I do feel it's a choice. It doesn't feel lazy to me. Like uh, all of the greats know when to pull back and just show the image and not the stuff that's happening in the background. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't think it's as bad as you say. I think there's some images you're right. There's no backgrounds, but I, I like it feels it feels deliberate. But what do I know? Yeah, there's a couple. No, it's fifty fifty. Okay. I feel it's twenty five seventy five. No. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Doesn't matter to me. Um, so there, Scott's like Captain America is on the run, man. You know, I'm carrying the single most important woman in the galaxy. You're carrying her guru. Like I just love these conversations. Like I, ah, so good. Um, and he's like, we hit the ground running and we stopped Cassandra Nova. And he's like, he has a sort of RoboCop smile to him. And <laughs> And it's fucking, it's fucking awesome. And yeah, he's kind of ready to go. Hell. When later when he arrives, he just dumps Cassandra into some kid's arms. Yeah. Uh, in the in he the side of Yeah. Yeah. Thank God you're okay, Scott. You're my favorite superhero. I love you too, Gene. And he's but he's already moving forward on the Cassandra Nova plan. Yeah, yeah. He just shows up. Oh, good. You're okay. All right. Here we go. <laughs> no one died. Great. Yeah. All right, time Zorn. for the team. Well, who's Zorn got over his shoulder? Oh, he's got uh, uh, the the guru guy, like fucking what's his name, who doesn't show up. He doesn't serve any purpose to the story, so he just gets slumped. He gets a hospital like hallway care. Yeah, uh, it was pretty upsetting when he was like, when <laughs> she's like, kill this man, and they just slowly torture him. She's like slow roasting him until Scott shows up. Oh, I guess that I guess that did <laughs> guess that did happen. He's a little out of control. Yeah, but do you think the healer would be able to deal with him? Okay. Who's Zorn? I'm, well, these are the Easter eggs for Magneto here now. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Elaborate on that. What do you mean? Well, that that's what he he's the first of all he doesn't heal that fucking guru or Cassandra Nova. <laughs> yeah. So those are red flags, and then he immediately serves his purpose when or he arrives can't do anything with cassandra nova's body at all yeah this one is dead you're wrong yep. to bring me here scott i'm like okay the the, the 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 he just brought a bird back to life in the beginning of this arc so obviously yeah, that's yeah. weird and then he's yep. able to immediately eradicate sentinels basically so well yeah that's we're, it. Yeah. we're like i can immediately eradicate nano sentinels for you so yeah. wait a second hang on these powers are suspect uh, yeah, but they're not, you know, but like at the same, like, not like, yet. It's, it's Jeff Loeb territory. Like, I like looking back, you're like, okay, well, I guess maybe you're right. But Cassandra was dying. Like, like, she's fucking dead. There's nothing to do from there, right? Fair and enough, and they yeah. didn't want to heal her anyway. And like, the whole thing was like, don't heal her. And so, like, he shows up uh, and he's like, actually, I can see, I'm, you know, I'm here to heal you. Like, I, 
it just it's none of it none of it makes any sense to be Magneto. <laughs> just like I just want to I want to hammer on this over and over and over because I never get tired oh, of it. Oh, I I felt like it was a little more Magneto-ish here. And yeah, yeah, I'm not, I, I can't accept that. You know, like when he jumps on her back and like, I'm here to heal you, you know, like, yeah, Magneto would never do that. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, right? Like Magneto would never do that. And I can't accept that he has like some sort of para personality that allowed him to, to just like enter into this other, this other thing. Um, there's, there was other ways that Morrison could have sold the mystery if they actually had intended to do so. And they, you know, I've said this before. I'll say it again. It's Jeff Loeb. Like, it's all it's a fucking Jeff Loeb job. So where do you th- I guess we have to get farther into the book. No. So, like, where oh. do you think he made the decision? Oh, right. At you Xavier. you right feel at like Xavier's. it's not here. Yeah, it's right at Xavier's for sure. When he kills all those U-men and does that thing with the the finger up. Shh. And that's when the audience is like uh, beguiled into the concept that, that maybe there's like. Yeah, that, that's something it. That's wrong with this character but in, and you, also the, you, you think that grant made that decision at that time also then i do yes yeah yeah but but i, I think they made that i think so i know from their pitch their original pitch that they had in mind a magneto story um and i'm even willing to accept that they always had in mind that zorn was going to become magneto my gripe is they did a Jeff Loeb on us um, because it's a monthly comic and they just like, and they, they just didn't care about my intelligence, um, which is fair. Fine. I'm reading comics. You, know, you can insult my intelligence. It's fine. It happens every day. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's what happened. That's what I think anyway. Uh, yeah. I, 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 yeah. I, I have a so. them it feels that way. Watch out, Morrison. You're, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fucking be very upset with you one day. Yeah, I, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I want to give him the benefit of the doubt and say that, like, if he planned it to be Zorn the whole way along, that he would have done mm-hmm. better. Yeah. Well, well, I, I think that's why I get so upset about it because there's two possibilities. It's, it's one. It was, it was just like a, um, a pivot. At a certain point, you know, like a like a soap opera pivot, like where Stefano's actually, you know, like I don't know, whatever. Um, they and, were all sitting around, and somebody talked to him, and he talked to editorial, and he's like, "Well, let's just do this." Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's one option, and that's insulting. Or the well, other no, option. No, not is really. They, I, I I'm more willing to be okay with that. I feel like, than, but. Okay, well, I, I'm, I like, I, you know, we differed. You know, like, I'm, I'm not okay. With, yeah. I'm not okay with any of it. That makes you mad. I'm okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, because like, don't fucking. You've got carte blanche. You're this big writer. Fucking write. It's like just, just if you're gonna plant seeds in the past, plant seeds and then let them flower or whatever. Like, do a good job. Plot, plot, dude. Like even Grant Morrison. <laughs> oh no, just Grant Morrison. Even Neil Gaiman can do better than you in in <gasps> that. Like. And that's insulting. That's insulting and um, sad. But whatever. You don't mean Sword. that. I do. <laughs> you take that back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you're going to regret that later, buddy. <laughs> if you die tomorrow, do you want everybody to think that's what you think? Um, so. Uh, so he's healing the people. Sorry, that was a bit. That was a huge digression on he's healing everybody. Um, and I, I I do love Charles' voice in all of this or whatever. Like, and this is the the thing where he says forty years clinging to a sewer wall, waiting until she oh. was strong enough to walk free. Like that's that. That's gross. Yeah, well, then that's not that that, that like uh, aborted, not aborted fetus, but miscarriage flushed down yeah. the toilet thing, right? I like. I like this little legend of the the Mumadry or whatever the, uh, the oh the yes sure yeah. have yeah so it's yeah. like basically the idea is that everyone in the womb encounters like their their exact opposite like the uh, the sort of existential opposite but because Charles is the world's most powerful telepath that takes this form is able to like cling to existence uh, mm-hmm. and he senses the evil of it and that's why he tried to to kill it in the womb but it's neat like because it's it is a, it is 
the first encounter, even that is explicitly said with the other, like the existential opposite. So, um, you know, it's, it's how, how do you learn to, to relate to the other? Um, and, uh, that's, again, I mean, I kind of hammer the same point here, but the, Mm -hmm. you know, like the whole idea of like intolerance, prejudice, like it all comes from, from your orientation towards that. And that's a standard, like, positions yourself as like the you know the ultimate and even actually i had this idea uh it just struck me like in cross when we read that um and like the 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 theory was that there's something innate in humanity that's like that eventually like you know it's sort of like a kill switch or like a trigger but like that's mm. I, she's that like she's even like outlining her vision like mothers will cannibalize their children lovers will yeah. savage their darlings and i was like i want someone oh, to write this like this this cross fandom x-men cross that'd be great wow yeah like like uh, the universe where cassandra is successful and the yeah, x-men yeah, yeah. don't succeed like like mutual aid doesn't succeed oh wow that the and alternate. that's and i think that like that you know, that's such an interesting contrast with with uh, garth ennis because like i think both writers are, are extremely humanist but morrison generally like like he's a he's a good vibes dude you know and yeah. garth is a bad vibes dude <laughs> like, <laughs> but there's a like, scheme where they he like likes to laugh at the them. bad vibes like that's yeah. how he survives it but yeah well uh, i think the world you're describing chris is in deadpool Wolverine. oh uh, yeah. uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> gotta think about that one for a second uh, it's not extreme enough though yeah true so I, I think they're like this is also like the Jungian thing, right? Like you know, one is and the and the Graf thing. You know, like in the in the womb, one encounters the fact that your the womb is the other. You know, like like you you encounter difference at a certain point, like the unconscious difference in the womb. Um, and I think it, you know, like like I've commented on this before, but Cerebra is the womb in this instance. There's something about the the technology as world uh in all of this like this mutant detecting technology which has been at the center of this this entire time and it's been like the symbol of that that battle between um uh cassandra and professor xavier like it's literally their mother's womb like that's what she thinks they're fighting over and i and perhaps like and that's what Charles Xavier has recreated as part of his new vision, right? Mm, yeah. It's like he's brought her into the world. They're they're enacting some sort of primordial, like, um, Groff Jungian drama where the shadow has been brought in. And it has something yeah. to do with, like, how your mother birthed you. And uh, he gets reborn through it, too, because, like, she shatters his consciousness and, like, sends it out into every little bit, little bit of Charles and everybody. It's that, like, sort of, like, mm-hmm. uh, like dream, like, uh, I don't know, like. Um, like Japanese, like a uh, magical girl moment where like just like rays of sunshine and rainbows like spill out into the world, like and everyone's a little bit better, but then pulls it all back and like just like slams Cassandra with it because uh, she's dared to 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 try to seize that power. And I think the individuals who are drawn is um, here, the people they get um, Xavier's consciousness, it like. So you get three images. Um, one, it, like, I don't know what I'm looking at in the first one, but it looks like they're, they've are they been dealing with some sort of riot or something. I don't know. Like, there's a lot of mutants who, they're coming to some sort of, there's been some chaos. You can tell because there's litter all over the ground. And then there's homeless people. And then there's protesters. Um, it's it's a very, like, you know, here's the, the, the oppressed, the marginalized, the activists, and come together now in the form of the Scarlet woman who rides the world uh, in sort of like, like Alistair Crowley esque kind of imagery. Um, And then, and then she forgets. Right. Um, And uh, this goes, what you're saying, uh, James, like there's a lot of like imagery that evokes what we would nowadays call like social justice activism kind of thing you know like that that's that's what the x-men are being positioned as um in these comics uh but more explicitly than i realized looking at those images but you know i guess that's the point 
I don't think Wolverine and Beast come off really well in this story. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. They don't, they don't do too it, Not bad. in this story, but in this <laughs> issue. These are very cosmic threats. Wolverine can smell the dupe that they pulled with Cassandra Nova's body. He's like, hold, hold off, Hank. He can, he That's can true. Smell. He does he can smell it. it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he does have that thing. He's like, you know, I, you can't even see your own weaknesses because you don't know where to look. But I do. You know, like there's That's that. a cool moment. It is a cool moment, but then it amounts to nothing, right? Like, then he gets beaten until he's attacked by some children or whatever. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think that's the, yeah. the real flaw, exactly. Yeah. I have no weaknesses, Mr. Logan. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's kind of, and he looks dumb. He looks dumb. He's wearing suspenders. What the fuck am I looking at? Like, what? And then, and then Beast's like thing, like like embracing his primordialism, like I, it doesn't it doesn't come off well because like it doesn't accomplish anything. I don't yeah. understand what's being attempted to like what what are they communicating here? He um, injects her with something, but it doesn't. There's no payoff, I don't think, unless it happens in later issues. Well, uh, what yeah, what are they trying to do in that? No, I don't think it does. They're, like they're trying to knock her out. They're trying to knock her out, if I recall. That's what's in those things. Um. Yeah, I should remember that, but I don't. Anyway. Um. There is a uh, Scott. He's getting pulled into the black bug room, and he says, "I'm sorry, Gene. I'm going to let you down. I can't help it. I'm going to ruin everything." Uh, that's sneak preview for season two. Like this is the end of season one. Twelve issues. Uh. I'm going to ruin everything. That's an allusion to like what's going to happen with him and Emma. Uh, like he's he's confessing to her in that moment. Like like I'm gonna that this is going to happen. Um, but you don't take it in that moment as him saying that. Uh, it's just like it's just your typical like Scott Summers self doubt kind of bullshit, right? Your husband is busy with his many many inner demons, Gene. Yeah. yeah, he's got. What do you it. Think of, yeah, what do you think of this defeat of? Uh, I love Cassandra. Nova. Such a good Jean Grey moment where she got the like uh, the Gandalf shall not pass like the phoenix <laughs> over the thing, and right. uh, yeah, you're not welcome in his body or this world, Cassandra. That's uh, that's a threat. Oh, when she does oh, the uh, bodiless, my precious body. <laughs> Yeah. Eat, mm, skin, bone, divide. I like uh, even rewinding a little bit. I I do love this speech, and and again, this is this is like it's, it's literally underlined in these comics. Um, there's only one of you in the whole world, and to tell the truth, you don't stand a chance. You may be, be an expert in fear, isolation, loss, pain, and hatred, but you have no idea what friendship is. Uh. Uh, yeah, again, that was that was very profound for me, and I think it r- remains profound today. You know, like there's all these these feelings that you can have, and you know, like the point of human camaraderie is to you know partly uh, overcome those fears, right? I mean, that's the social justice vision. It's it, it's not a political vision; it's an emotional vision. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Check out the body language as she starts that speech, too. She's just, like, so casual. Like, just, like, kind of, like, leaning back, you know? Like Yeah. Yeah. It's it's good. Yeah, it like, sells like, it so hard. Like, Morrison's Superman. Morrison's, Morrison's insight with Superman was uh, that Superman doesn't... He's not tense. He's fucking relaxed. Um, because he's the toughest guy. You know, he doesn't get hurt. You know, and he's super smart. And he's a great guy. He's a great guy. Um, and Gene, yeah, it's the same fucking thing. Uh mm-hmm. Yeah, I picked that up too. Like the the and and that's part of the that was part of the early discussion about the Phoenix Force power was that mm-hmm. she's not. It's not like the last time it happened. Like they're worried she could lose control, but she just shows she's in control. But not only in control, in like comfortable control. Like like there's no there's no concern. Her power levels above and beyond. Yeah, and and to the to so you'll remember you know the Dark Phoenix saga um, to our chagrin like it was all about pervy sex and uh, fear of women's power um, and their 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 
libido um, and it's in the way in which it could threaten existence itself. Um, and Morrison's taking that and like, actually, actually, I, I don't know if they're, they're taking like the pervy sex thing. They clearly aren't because she's like super clothed. Um, and, but, but just like taking the Phoenix force and, and, you know, making it a, a more sturdy element of the uh, X-Men's mission and like the metaphor surrounding them. Um, like the Phoenix becomes like sort of this embodiment of, of good vibes. Uh, and, and maybe there's a, and, but mm. emphasizes that there's a danger inherent in the good vibes. That's uh, really interesting. I, I like that reading and I, yeah, it's, it's such a powerful force that like, you can't just be all like, I, I really like that you're tying it into that. Like this sort of like a uh, fear of, um, of women's sex. Yeah. Like power, liberation, whatever. Cause yeah, I do yeah. feel like that is, that is in the Claremont version. I, absolutely. And it is, this is a twist on it. And like that explains perfectly why you can have the Phoenix not be that world ending threat because like there's now some mastery over it. Yeah. Yeah. She's like, it's not like last time, Scott, you know, I'm not like, we don't have to worry about the Republicans anymore. Like it's like, like <laughs> things, things are decidedly, you know, like this way now. Um, okay. So what do we think of the fact that what they do with Cassandra is basically put her in an, in an, uh, re-education camp. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, that's, with their Nazi uniforms and stuff like it's very sinister I know it's meant to be portrayed as, in a certain way but like it's quite it's quite extreme um, problematic but I think given the nature of the threat I'm going to be I'm okay with it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair what, but what well, does it they mean I guess... they're stupid too so yeah. it's like they it's almost like a it's like almost like a petty revenge. Yeah. And who's who's being saved? OK, so there's the immensity, the um, Imundra or whatever it is um, in the background. And then there's Cassandra Nova, like Charles Xavier's sister, essentially. Um, and they've separated the two of them. So like. So ultimately, like it's Charles speaking to her, to his sister, like his elderly confused developmentally disabled sister and bringing yeah. her to you know like like it's time you have an awesome power you you like me have the most awesome power that any you know like it like i it's difficult to describe how powerful i am and you too are like that but you're not you have no concept of humanity you you were generative ai at this point up until now and now it's time for you to like go through learn about apples yeah, yeah. While your Imundra rips up pieces of paper in the background, like a yeah, just like a <laughs> like a brat, yeah, just like ah, I don't care about civilization. I'm ah. It's um, interesting that the only feature in this room is like a map of the, uh, yes. the National Atlas of the United States showing yeah. the red and blue straits. Yes, yeah, like what, like I don't know what, it, like I, I, and the fact that like it's so disciplinarian. It's it's everything that the Xavier in, Institute isn't actually right. It's like I there's it, and I, like this encapsulates the the Morrisonian contradiction like almost perfectly in a way that I didn't expect until looking at it right now. Um, there's there's the image and then there's here's the social project buried underneath it. Um, and it's yeah, it's it's very strange. Um, but again, this is why I love these comics, because it's so fruitful. Um, yeah, I. I I just find myself thinking in a million directions at any given time. And that's all I've ever wanted from Morrison. And yeah, it, like, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. You know. I don't, I, I, uh, I hate to keep tying it back to the invisibles, but like, it just struck hmm. me now that like the opening images of, um, of the comic are, are like Dane in that, in that sort of environment and like, just like, you know, resisting against it. Uh, that the, the idea of like mass education or just sort of like that, like rote learning and all that stuff. Right, and right, right. Weird, weird, weird thing to come. It is, it is, a, yeah, an uncomfortable thing to come back to. But I do think that, like, the, like if you are the annihilation of, if you're crossed, uh, if the, if the only options are like destroying you and like that's against your principles or like retraining you, I'm gonna mm. say extreme circumstances maybe call for extreme measures. 
Yeah, and the funny <laughs> you remember across plus one hundred or whatever, isn't that like? <laughs> that's right. That's, <laughs> it's yeah, kind of like that. The, yeah. Alan Moore was like, I already know what to do. And yeah, like it's the, the triangulating between the three of them using crossed as the way to do it is really interesting. I, uh, I would have loved to have read Grant Morrison's crossed, but it would never have happened. Yeah. Um, I think it's antithetical to their like entire ethos. Cowards. Um, yeah. Mm. Then your Imperial ends with Chucky stepping out of the womb, umbilical cord yeah. dangling Dan. Yes, that's right. Yeah, true. Yeah. Yeah, no, he's he's reborn and he can walk again or whatever, and he's oh. Christ like and Oh shit. And it is actually ending on the image of the wheel, which was broken at the start too. Oh my goodness, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, everything's fine. And the wheel is yeah. the the yeah. not the womb but I suppose the canal in which well, like, it's, the, it's both. the child yeah, is absolutely. born. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, like Morrison, I, you you've referred to him as an allegorist. Um, and I was thinking about it while I was making supper and I was like, I don't know if that's quite true, but he's definitely a symbolist. Um, and I like and I I meant that I don't mean not to be petty, but I'm just trying to like, well, what's he up to? Um, anyway, yeah, well, he's definitely a potent symbolist. Um, and that that's definitely at work here. Um. Yeah. I don't know. I I found these comics so I I I thrill at rereading them. Like I sk- I skim over the bad art because nothing happens in those issues anyway. Frankly, <laughs> so I'm just like whatever. Uh. And I uh, I think one of my favorite comics ever is issue 126. Um. I love to look through it. I love to think about the ideas that are being presented. I love what it does with superheroes. Uh, and, and not just superheroes, but some of my, like the, my beloved superheroes, my beloved X-Men are given so much love and so much like, like, like a proper treatment. Um, and their, their, their existence is made to feel like philosophically meaningful and also like a fun adventure. And I, yeah, it's great. Now, all we need is a little energon. And a lot of luck. 